Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go to Twitter and I'll look at what you just posted and I'll do my share. There we go. Okay, share it to Facebook, share it to Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm doing great. We don't do this enough. <laughs> I wish I could do it more. Oh, on YouTube or on, well, I think I it's better now. I think they'll be able. Oh yeah, I was just muted on OBS. Sorry guys. <laughs> um, OBS I, is you is uh, that's your software? Yeah, that's the software I use to stream. Oh okay okay. Yeah, but should be good now. Yeah, I know they're saying they can't hear me, but I think they'll be able to hear me now. Um, sorry guys, <laughs> that's the first time <laughs> that's happened. But uh, anyway, I guess I'll just restart what everything I said. Um, hello, Eric. How are, uh, good to have you back on. Um, I, I really appreciate all of like the, the theological nuances and, and insight that you bring to the table here. And today we're, we're going to talk all about, you know, Pope Francis and the death penalty. And what I was saying while I didn't realize I was being muted was that, you know, I spent a lot of time defending the Pope and, uh, Fiducia sub, uh, depending, defending the, DDF's document, Fiducia Supplicans, just because I thought that a lot of critiques of it were rooted in misconceptions of, of, of the document. But I, but ever since Dignitas Infinita came out, I, I think that I've received the impression that this papacy is just becoming less and less and less and less careful about retaining even like the appearance of doctrinal continuity i think perhaps eric would even concede that there was there there was at the very least a a um full throated attempt at at least giving the impression of doctrinal continuity with fiducia supplicans but with Dignitas Infinita on, on the death penalty in particular, it's like that pretense has just now gone out the window. And, and I don't even see an attempt at reconciling the current position on the death penalty with what has been taught before. What, what are your first impressions, Eric? And then, of course, if you wanted to say anything 
else uh, to preface your comments, feel free to do that. Yeah, well, I you know I just want to say uh, thank you for having me back on again. Um, as I was saying before, uh, when you were muted, um, but now since we've got more of an audience, I'll say it again uh, that I, I wish we could do this more often. It'd be cool to uh, um, you know be able to uh, have these important discussions in a audio format um, between people who are serious, charitable, and uh, we're both willing to, you know, reform our opinions based on the evidence. And um, we're at like a once a year rate now. That's too low. <laughs> I'll at least kick it up to, to uh, you know. Quarterly. Yeah. <laughs> well, on, uh, on your comments, um, yeah, I, I do think that uh, what, what's, I guess what has been confirmed for me with uh, – this most recent uh, magisterial document, um, you know, through the you know agency of the magisterium, uh, is uh, that when when Pope Francis talks about do, uh, doctrinal development and harmony with tradition, um, he often says that as if to say. As if, and people often take him to mean that, well, the teaching has remained the same, but maybe some prudential applications have changed. Um, and I, I want to say that uh, Francis is actually uh, saying something more than that. And that's been confirmed with the writings and commentaries and interviews by Cardinal Fernandez, who seems to try and refer back to like slavery and um, you know just war and uh, di diff other different evils of the past that there seems to be a magisterial reversal you know and and so they emphasize continuity continuity but what they mean by that is there are there are certain discontinuities happening at the same time. And and so when they're talking about doctrinal development, um, they're not talking about it in the very healthy, very acceptable way um, that you would hear from like, uh, you know, an, uh, uh, a conservative Newman, Newmanite or something like that. They, they they're they're really talking about um, something that wasn't really appreciated in the past by the magisterium. Yeah. You know, they use this language um, and you find origins of this kind of language in Vatican II, but not quite applied in the same way um, about how we, we, we've we come to a deeper awareness of a, of a certain phenomena. We've come to a deeper and increased awareness of some reality and the gradual discovery of this reality is seems to be on empirical grounds and upon the discovery upon the gradual discovery and deepening of our awareness of this reality now we have to adjust we have to modify and eventually change certain doctrinal propositions or axioms or presuppositions in order to fit our theology in with this newfound empirical awareness of this reality. And it seems to me that this reality that they're talking about is the infinite dignity of the human person. Yes. Yeah. If you want to say a few things about that, just because like that seems to me like this sort of trajectory does eventually run itself up against a wall here and that wall is and i don't mean to sound like some sensationalist but it is pius x's condemnation of modernism and the evolution of doctrine and the evolution of yeah. dogma um <laughs> yeah. it seems to me that that and, and that remained firm for a very long time that you know we can accept uh, 
in on, on like like you were saying Numenite terms a certain deepening of our understanding of, of certain key doctrines but always in the same sense and judgment of what has come before but now it seems like you know the tail's wagging the dog a bit now in terms of like the church's relationship to new uh to like empirical investigation or even like just social evolution yes yeah, and I, I think that, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, some people try to point out on, on the death penalty, for example, uh, how Cardinal Ladaria in his address to the bishops and uh, Pope Francis in his several addresses um, in the Synod Hall on Wednesdays, and he has said things in the public interviews and things that um, make it sound like that this is... Uh, uh, de that development of doctrine is part of the Holy Spirit's activity in the church. And they've even tried to root this in like uh, St. Vincent de Lorenz, his uh, commonatorium about something uh, that there is true progress in religion and things um, that are sometimes uh, said in a way that the clarity of it is not as polished. So with time, meditation and uh, explication, uh, things become more clear. And the although it has to retain the same meaning, the same intent, the same content, um, but for Francis, and, and I'll just go ahead and say it, um, you know, I believe now it's been confirmed to me, you know, with my studies uh, for the past, you know, five plus years on this matter. Um, I believe he does teach that the death penalty is intrinsically evil, and right up there with abortion and, and euthanasia. Let's really get into that. Because in <laughs> that's going to be the content. That's the, that seems, seems to be like the point of contention. A lot of people are going to disagree with that. And it's really yeah. people who are desperately trying to hang on to this assurance that they can have in the this charism of safety notion right that that uh no matter what the pope teaches in his authentic magisterium it's never going to even purely materially speaking it's never going to conflict with settled definitive church doctrine right um and for whatever reason so for some people that is like that like the the indefectibility indefectibility of the church hangs on a thread and that thread is that charism of safety like that such that if you can prove or demonstrate uh that level of doctrinal discontinuity or conflict that would have to yield some undermining of the divine promises given to the church the protection of the holy spirit because they read into the protection of the Holy Spirit this idea that um, not only is the Pope infallible, uh, excuse me, and not only is the Pope infallible under a certain set of criteria, but he is also um, prevented from making a from committing a doctrinal error that is that would of itself be harmful to souls i yeah. think i'm getting that right <laughs> uh, yeah. maybe there's some some minute subtlety that 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 if, if lofton heard he would make a three hour oh, video i'm sure he would <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he would find a reason to find to say that's not ad adequate yeah. but, but it does seem like so that is seems to me to be the motivation for why people would want to take issue with what you just said and for a little while i think they had some solid ground because pope francis at least before seemed to be a little bit more careful in how he articulated his opposition to the death penalty it was kind of like a an intensification if you will of john paul ii's opposition which which i thought was fine uh like john paul ii he he, and he admitted and it was in the catechism that you know that the death penalty in itself could be licit, but in light of the gospel and in, in light of the current circumstances that we live in, it seems like the need for it is no longer there, 
and because it's always better to show mercy than to punish if all things being equal uh, we should opt for the merciful route right um and, and then Ratzinger came out and said, okay, like that's a prudential judgment and you wouldn't even be unfit for Holy Communion if you, if you parted ways with the Holy Father on this issue. And Pope Francis for a little while seemed to just intensify that language a bit, but over the course of years, it, it just became more and more and more and more absolute. And I think Dignitas Infinita is like that final nail in the coffin that no, he's saying that there are no circumstances under which it could be Licit, and That's, um, maybe you can give your reasoning for why that is your interpretation, and then we can take on some of the objections to that interpretation. Because, as you know, there there's, there's people out there, uh, like Lofton and others, like three hour length videos, just trying to, uh, trying to avoid that conclusion. So I, I would like to address that with you. Yeah, well. Um... You know, uh, as I was saying, you know, Pope Francis sees the recent teaching on the death penalty as an application of the Holy Spirit in the church of what St. Vincent Lorenz called the progress or development of doctrine. And um, the, the way he sees it um, that way is that uh, the death penalty has been understood both in society, by states, by theologians, by church fathers, and even by the past magisterium. Pope Francis has even made reference to uh, with much sadness, and lamenting even what has taken place in Vatican City during the papal states um, for centuries, according to him, quote, he, he says centuries. Um, that uh, that th there used to be a view that the death penalty, qua penalty, as a punishment, uh, a punishment to repay an offender for a serious crime, that that was held and that was understood and that was believed. But there was also something else taught by the church since the beginning, and that is the dignity of man. And so you've got these two um, these two horses that are running side by side. You've got the horse that's human dignity, and then you've got the horse that says we can use that the death penalty is justified, right? And eventually, what happens is the the horse for that's racing for human dignity gets stronger, faster. And um, it starts to accumulate the victory. And the, the horse that's running in support of the death penalty just sort of drains out, loses energy, and just, you know, loses the race completely and falls by the wayside. Um, and so for him, for Pope Francis, and for uh, certainly for uh, Fernandez, um, they'll say, well, this is a a, a this this is a, a uh, an example of doctrinal development because the human dignity part had always been there and even though the death penalty justification was there um it slowly you know through discernment through an aware through new awarenesses um what we've understood now is that human dignity is winning that race and because it's winning that race the death penalty is completely, um, it's completely eliminated now. And it's its understood to be on par with um, any other um, violation of human dignity, like abortion or euthanasia. If you look at the catechism of the Catholic Church, you're not going to find intrinsic evil, intrinsic evil, like the word intrinsically evil, all over the place for euthanasia and abortion, it it'll it it most often utilizes the offense against human dignity, the dignity of the human person, the respect for life, and all these things. Those are terms that, um, um, the, the, it, you know, it's not always employing the word intrinsic, right? But it certainly means 
that is of itself morally unacceptable, abortion, euthanasia, the direct murder of, a, of an innocent human being. Um, and so those all those terms are being used now about the death penalty. And um, so, I mean, that's the short, my short, I mean, I have tons of things I could say about yeah. what Francis has said, but let's just start, let, let's just start with what he said in um, uh, this recent document where uh, he said in, in uh, Dignitas Infinita, he says, beyond all circumstance, every human person, uh, every human person possesses an infinite dignity, inalienably grounded in his or her very being. That, that, that's what you got to underline, in, in, in his or her very being, which prevails in and beyond every circumstance, state or situation. Um, and then later on, in a, in a list of things that are um, obviously intrinsically evil, um, there is mention of the death penalty. And in that statement, alongside, you know, um, kidnapping, uh, abortion, genocide, euthanasia, willful suicide, um, human trafficking, other things, prostitution, deportation, and uh, arbitrary imprisonment, um, you know, the selling of women and children. Then he says, he says, here one should also mention the death penalty. For this also violates the inalienable dignity of every person, regardless of the circumstances. Yeah, and he and this is where we can address this first objection. And I, I'm just astounded that people make this counter argument that he's not saying it's intrinsically evil in every you know circumstance because, or rather, maybe I could phrase it this way: what he's saying is that. So in every circumstance, it is a violation of human dignity. But he didn't technically say that every violation of human dignity under the sun constitutes a moral evil, a sin. Therefore, right. we can find – therefore, while we can acknowledge that every exercise of the death penalty, every recourse to capital punishment constitutes a violation of human dignity, it doesn't necessarily – always constitute a sin. Now, right. I, I'm astounded by this reasoning because it says right in the document, it uses the word inalienable. Yeah. So what does inalienable mean? It means it cannot be taken away. It's inviolable. So are we to believe that somehow he's, he's opening the door for an allowable violation of inviolable dignity? I mean that's a contradiction in terms. Like that's that's just that's just absurd on its face. Uh, yeah, it would be subtracting what he's adding. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, am, am I insane? Because like he's saying it's 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 inalienable. I mean he he's getting at the fact that this dignity is inviolable. And then other people will say, okay, well, isn't it a violation of human dignity to kill somebody in uh, self defense? They use the self-defense right. counter-argument. Double and effect. Yeah. We can, yeah, and along the lines of, doctrine of, double, of the doctrine of double effect. See, my problem with that, and you can chime in on this too, is that I think most people making that argument, they are not delving deeply enough into the actual philosophical justification of self-defense that's in our tradition. So... St. Thomas Aquinas, when he talks about self-defense, it's actually very interesting. When when he because he's 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 has to be very careful about this, uh, because willful murder is always wrong. It's an intrinsically evil act, and That's so right. how could killing somebody ever be morally legitimate? Well, the short answer is it's not. So when you're when you're defending yourself and you have to use lethal force to defend yourself, St. Thomas Aquinas says that you still can't really intentionally and directly kill the assailant. In other words, your slaying of the assailant cannot be as a result of an intention to do so as such. Right. Hence the doctrine of double effect. You don't intend to 
directly kill the person you are the direct action is your defense of your own person which as an unintended consequence results in the death of the assailant but that's the same justification for why you can remove a fetus you can remove a uterus um in a pregnancy that threatens the life of the mother with the fetus and and uh where, where, where the baby ends up dying as a byproduct, but there's still not a direct and intentional abortion committed. There's not a direct and intentional killing. And that's the only reason why that's a justified action. So, and that can never be the case with the death penalty. The death penalty is always a direct and intentional killing of the offender. Mm -hmm. And St. Thomas Aquinas would say, okay, the reason why that's okay is because that carries with it the authority of the state, which is instituted by God. Mm -hmm. And that is not the case with self-defense. With self-defense, you're your own person. You're not acting on behalf of the state. You don't have legitimacy to directly and intentionally kill the assailant. And that's still always that would still always be wrong unless it carries with it stately authority, which is backed up by divine authority. It's like how Jesus says, what man and woman put together, or what God has joined together in, in, in marriage, let no man put asunder. Well, that's, that's like the soul and the body. God has put those two together. No man can put those asunder. Only God's authority can separate the soul and the body legitimately, and which is the entire reason why we have just war and why we have, why it is acceptable, why why the death penalty can be morally acceptable, is because of that. And and so this this uh, self defense line of reasoning that that they're coming up with is just born out of an ignorance and a, a, a lack of sophistication about moral philosophy vis a vis self defense. Uh, I let you chime in and give give your insights. Yeah, no, I think you're right. You know the um, the people who are saying that um, that Pope Francis says. You know, or this document, which Pope Francis, uh, you know, uh, approves of, it says that um, the death penalty is a violation of the inalienable dignity of every human person, regardless of the circumstances. That's true, but that doesn't mean there are not justified violations of said dignity. And um, I was listening to uh, Michael Lofton's take on this. And he, I believe, and I'm going off of memory here, I, I had listened to it the day it came out, which was, this, this was, uh, I think, a day or two after. So we're talking about uh, the 9th of this month, April 9th, so 10 days ago. But I think he referred to, like, you know, self-defense and double effect and things like this. But as you were saying, um, the double effect principle and self-defense principle that does not alleviate the intrinsic evil of the death penalty. That just means that in circumstances where there can be thought of conceivably um, the uh, some sort of a uh, an intention to do one thing that's good um, results necessarily or certainly in the death of an assailant, an aggressor, or in the case of like, a, a, you know, an ectopic pregnancy, the, the life of the unborn, um, that doesn't take away the intrinsic evil of abortion or murder. Um, so it, it wouldn't be, you know, it, we wouldn't call it like justified violations of human dignity when we bomb a, a military target, for example, and we and we know that it's certain that uh, innocent civilians are going to die as a result of it, you know, based upon proportionality. Um, that's not a justified violation of, of human dignity. That's the, the it's the principle of double, double effect that comes into play. It's no but, formal act of killing the innocent there. Right. Exactly. But in the death penalty, you can't employ this self-defense uh, principle of du double effect because, and, and this is what uh, I think, uh, you know, people such as uh, 
um, you know, like Christian Wagner from Scholastic Answers, Michael Lofton, and some others who I've seen who have been employing the same understanding, is um, you, 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 we have, we've got to understand what the death penalty is. The death penalty is a punishment inflicted by the state in order to rebalance the scale of justice that's been um, made unequal by a certain grave offense. And that's what the death penalty is, you know. Um, so when we, one of the things that has really been revolutionary, even though we might say that St. John Paul II's teaching on the death penalty um, did not come to, you know, the full extent that uh, Pope Francis's did. But when, when, when John Paul revised the catechism to speak of the death penalty as a matter of self-defense, um, that, I think, is, uh, it, you know, that right there was sort of revolutionary because what is it that you're doing um, when you when you say, well, the death penalty is the only way to ensure the protection of society, right, or the common good, to keep the common good safe, whatever, however you want to call it. Well, what that's saying is it's opening the door to saying that, well, if there is another way to keep the common good safe or the, you know, society safe, then it would be a mistreatment of human of the human person to inflict the penalty of death. And that, I think, opened the way um, for where we are now. Um, yeah. Is to, to root it in self-defense alone. And so the intention, you know, and, and you know, the death penalty, it being a direct of a, a direct elimination of life. I think what Pope Francis is thinking of is that if the death penalty were to be considered feasible or ad, admissible in former generations, it would have to be by double effect because yes, definitely because, because in a two a 2015 address. Uh, Pope Francis gave, he, he said the following, um, he said the following, and, and, and when he says things like this, um, what I'm about to say, uh, that's what guys like, you know, Lofton and, and others are looking at, and they're like, oh, see, it's circumstantial, it's not, it's, it's not talking about intrinsic evil. Well, l l listen to what Pope Francis said in, in 2015, he said, quote, in certain circumstances, when hostilities are underway, when hostilities are underway, a measured reaction is necessary in order to prevent the aggressor from causing harm. And the need to neutralize the aggressor may result in his elimination. Let, let, let me pause there for a second, uh, classical theist. W do you see how he's building up a statement here about circumstances? Yeah. Um, then, he, then he's talking about something that is double effect language. Right. When hostilities are underway. So he's talking about when there is a hostile event going on, a measured reaction, again, double effect self-defense principle language right there, a measured reaction. So it can't be over the top. It's got to be in proportion. Uh, a measured reaction is necessary in order to prevent the aggressor. So there you have the direct intention is to prevent the aggressor from causing harm. And the need to neutralize the aggressor may result in his elimination. This is double effect. Classical theist, th this is a, an address that he's giving on uh, the death penalty. So, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell the, the listeners here where they can go if they want to, uh, if they want to read this in full. 
type in Google letter of his holiness, Pope Francis, to the president of the International Commission Against the Death Penalty. So let me let me unpause. OK, so he, he brings that whole issue up. Right. The it, it, that um, in order to neutralize the aggressor, it may result in his elimination. Um, it, it is a case of le legitimate self-defense. This is what he says. He goes on. Nevertheless, the prerequisites of legitimate personal defense are not applicable in the social sphere without risk of distortion. In fact, when the death penalty is applied, people are killed not for current acts of aggression. Yep, right. But for offenses committed in the past. This is exactly the point I was making. Right. He goes on. This is yeah. Francis. It is applied to people whose captivity or their capacity to cause harm is no longer currently underway. And uh, and he goes on and on, but I'll stop right there. So in right. this 2015 address to the president of the International Commission against the death penalty, Pope Francis opens the door, he almost opens the door for the listeners to consider how he himself would conceive of a justification for the elimination of life and self-defense. And he completely, he completely takes the death penalty and alienates it from that. Yep. And so um, if and so in in Pope in Pope Francis's mind, if an aggressor has to be killed because of what he's posing as a threat to society, for example, um, it could only be justified by the principles of legitimate self-defense, which does not impede his understanding of the intrinsic evil of the death penalty. Exactly. Yeah, because because he is utilizing the doctrine of double effect to just broadly refer to legitimate self defense, but and and this it's it's sort of like an obvious conclusion that okay, if that's all you have, obviously the death penalty wouldn't be legitimate because. As he said, in the death penalty, there's no uh, there's no neutralization of an active assailant. You got him. That's right. You got him. He's in custody. He's not about to kill anybody. Um, and so the the only self defense purpose that capital punishment can serve really is one of deterrence, where you know the 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 threat of death can serve as a preventative mechanism for uh, for crime like against right. crime right and, but but at that point in order to justify something like that you cannot refer back to the doctrine of double effect because that 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 would make that would bring about teleological ethics, consequentialist ethics. That would be doing evil in order to avoid, or that 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 would be, uh, yeah, doing evil for yeah, the sake doing of evil that good, good purpose. Come. That good may come yeah. out of it, um, and so the only way that you could justify the death penalty, um, for that more teleological self defense purpose would be if you bring in just the legitimate authority of the state to carry this out yeah and that seems to me what pope francis is categorically rejecting he is he the is state because does not have the authority to take life period that's right yeah in in a 2017 address um, and just so you know, the listeners can uh, know which one I'm referring to. 
Um, this is a, an address of His Holiness Pope Francis to participants in the meeting promoted by the Pontifical Council for promoting, for promoting the new evangelization. He, he says this, that the punishment of death for criminals is deeply injurious of human dignity. It's an inhumane measure that regardless of how it is carried out, abases human dignity. He goes on to say, it is per se contrary to the gospel. Yep. And then when Lofton heard that, you know what he said? No. He said, yeah, this is a troubling statement, but he didn't say that in his magisterium. Oh, really? Well, Fernandez tells us that we should listen to everything Pope Francis says <laughs> yeah. and understand the intention. Um, but I, I, I know that, you know, sometimes the magisterial technicians will, will look at the <laughs> assertion versus the, te- the intentions. But um, he, he goes on, he says, it is per se contrary to the gospel. And he gives a reason. It's per se contrary to the gospel because, because it entails the willful suppression of a human life that never ceases to be sacred in the eyes of the creator and of which ultimately only God is the true judge and guarantor. Close quote. Uh, friends, that is the language for why abortion and euthanasia is yep. for Right. And the only way to avoid that conclusion is if you bring back into the discussion the authority of the state to take away life. And that is what Pope Francis is excluding. He doesn't, he, he doesn't believe there's really fundamentally any ontological distinction between the state carrying out that act and an individual carrying out that act. And for that reason, of course, the death penalty could not be justified because it would just be, you know, unlawful killing. Yeah, that's it what he says. Direct that's... and intentional killing. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, and it's and someone might say, okay, well then, as a church we would just have to go along with that because this is what the church is teaching about what the, the what the state has the authority to do and what the state does not have the authority to do. And the problem with that is, well, the church has already spoken on this issue. The church has already spoken definitively on this issue, actually. Um, we don't have to we don't have to appeal to some vague universal consensus of the fathers or or, or the universal consensus of theologians. I think you could just go back to Pope Innocent III. Like, Pope Innocent III prescribed to the Waldensians a professio fidei. And part of that profession of faith was that the death penalty could legitimately be used. That the death penalty, that the state could legitimately and licitly have recourse to capital punishment. That it does not constitute a grave sin in all cases. This was a precondition for the Waldensians' reconciliation to the church. That's what a profession of faith is, that you have to adhere to this profession in order to be considered in communion with the church, and which is why we generally and categorically consider professions of faith to be infallible. Um, Lofton certainly thinks so, because he's always talking about the profession of the recent profession of faith that speaks about, you know, the religious submission of mind and will to papal teaching. Mm -hmm. Um, And I got no problem with that. And but this is a profession of faith. So if you have a profession of faith that teaches authoritatively and definitively that the state can have recourse to capital punishment, well then Pope Francis's teaching cannot constitute a magisterial act because it's already overruled. Because he is trying to undermine the very... uh, He's undermining the 
only propositions that would make Pope Innocent III's teaching make sense, namely that the state can take life on its own divinely appointed authority, and that that is a categorically distinct kind of an action than on a personal, like on an interpersonal level, someone slaying another. Yeah, and and uh, I actually have the decree in front of me um, for the it, the statement that uh, the profession that the Waldensians were required to assent to is quote We declare that the secular power can, without mortal sin, impose a judgment of blood, provided the punishment is carried out not in hatred but with good judgment, not inconsiderately, but after mature deliberation, close quote. And so what is that? That is the state carrying out a direct and intentional death sentence. That's right. Direct. No, no, it's nothing not that Pope Francis, yeah, not double effect. There's no self, no justified violation of human dignity in light of defending this or that. Not, none of that. It's, it's a direct act. Um, of slaying someone uh, in punishment for their crime. And, and uh, in, in the same 2017 address that Pope Francis gave that I just qu quoted from before, um, Pope Francis goes on to talk about what has happened in the past. And, and this is here again, where guys like Lofton and other people who are defending Pope Francis's teaching as being consistent with the magisterial past, Anytime, like Pope Francis says, in the past or in centuries past or um, in, in former times in where, where protection of the society was scarce and society had not developed a mature, um, you know, sanctions of imprisonment and things like this. They always think, oh, see, this is this is our bread and butter to categorize this into prudence and um simply an application of the, the church's moral teaching for today. Well, listen to what he says. He says, this is Pope Francis, quote, in past centuries, when means of defense, listen to what he says, when means of defense were scarce and society had yet to develop and mature as it has, recourse to the death penalty appeared to be the logical consequence of the correct application of justice. Sadly, even in the papal states, recourse was had to this extreme and inhumane remedy that ignored the primacy of mercy over justice. Let us take responsibility for the past and recognize that the imposition of the death penalty was dictated by a mentality more legalistic than Christian. Nowadays, we are to remain, if we are to remain neutral, uh, we would be even more guilty. Close quote. So what you have here um, is... Pope Francis, number one, he's lamenting the, the use of the death penalty in centuries past, right? And then when he said when he tries to give an, an apology for it, he says, when means of defense were scarce and society had not yet developed and matured as it has, it appeared in the, the Italian is appariva, which means it appeared right. to be the logical consequence of the correct application of justice. He doesn't concede that it was the correct application of justice. Um, and, and notice the language here, again, is defense. and Because that's the only basis that Pope Francis can even imagine the elimination of life to be justified from. And unfortunately... 
it's no surprise then that in the same in, in Dignitas Infinita, he is is now starting to say that we have to move away from the logic that legitimizes even just warfare. Oh yeah, 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 and yeah. That, yeah, and, and that that it seems to me that if you apply the same principles that he had already articulated with regard to the death penalty, you got to do away with all just war. I mean, we got to be pacifists here. We 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 basically have to uh, um, remove entirely from the realm of morally acceptable actions any kind of uh, any kind of certainly any kind of um, offensive warfare that would still have remained safely within the boundaries of the criteria of just war. Um, but even defensive war, I mean, I, I don't see how even that could be legitimate because within any kind of warfare, you're always carrying out direct and intentional uh, violations of human dignity if you take this reasoning to its conclusion, right? Like, um, right. You, you can't do an airstrike uh, even against a... Um, even against enemy combatants, that's like a proportional and uh, and uh, measured, uh, narrowly targeted uh, right. action. You, you can't even do that because that still constitutes a direct and intentional violation of human dignity. And and I don't see how acts of war, even defensive acts of war that are aimed at protecting the innocent, could be. Um, justified on, on the grounds of the principle of double effect because it's no. again it's it's always a direct and intentional killing of another i, I just don't see how you how you can uh square that circle I, I don't think you can so it seems to me that his his um opposition to the death penalty has to imply categorical opposition to all warfare and he seems to indicate that i mean am i wrong I mean, he seems to indicate that in that document itself we could read it yeah which you know i, I don't think uh, he may not be aware of the logical tetris that results from his <laughs> teaching on the death penalty there um because i know elsewhere he has said um, that he does does not mean to condemn just war theory. If my memory serves right, I think he said something to the, like the Patriarch of Moscow, or I, I can't recall. See, that's off the just top. it, because it seems like he's moving beyond things that he's even said in the past. Mm. Like he he seems to be taking us even further than where he was before. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, on the whole warfare issue, I'm, I, you know, I'm not, um, you know, prepared to really say much, you know, about that because I, I, I you know, my focus has been on what he has said about um, the issue sure. with human dignity and as as it relates to like these other violations of human dignity, including the death penalty. But I wouldn't surprise me that. Um, He's he holds to certain principles that would require one to hold something else as a logical corollary, but he doesn't simply he doesn't he just doesn't go with it, you know. Um, and yeah, well, uh, I mean, partially because I think he knows that if he did, like, um, that yes. that's just like a manifestly untenable position to hold. I mean, that, that, that yeah. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I yeah, I think. Like, well, what, what is a Catholic soldier to do then? <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, all the chaplains would have to be fired. All the <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just a complete. It would be it would be a cooperation with evil. But um, I think that um, the death penalty issue, and, and it's interesting because um, I was listening, I was looking at reason in theology for. Uh, videos that were done in the past on the death penalty. I, I don't think I could find anything with me on it. I, I mean, I think at, the, at that time, 
I was trying to defend the whole, you know, um, there are justified violations of human dignity um, when it when it's required, you know, or something like that. Um, I was trying to, I mean, I, I even have two articles on my blog that, um, that contradict each other because at one point um, I, I thought Pope Francis was going in a certain direction, especially when he said that life imprisonment was a death penalty. Um, it was equal, uh, equally, um, equally sinful as the death penalty um, because it removes hope of reform. You know, it, remo- it removes hope from that aggressor. And um, so I, I even myself, I, I couldn't find anything when I was on Reason and Theology that, that went into it. But I found an interview between Michael Lofton and Christian Brugger, or Brugger, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. But I'm sure you're familiar with, with uh, Brugger because he, he participated uh, very mildly in the uh, contributed exchanges between uh, Ed Fazer, Robert Fastigi, um, I think even D- David Benley Hart. Um, well, Brugger went on to reason in theology to talk about the death penalty. And during that, uh, during that video, um, Brugger's, uh, he's basically saying that the church has changed its teaching but it's not a it's not de fide. He doesn't think it's he says that the 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 unanimous consensus of the fathers and the theologians, right, up to um you know up even the magisterium itself, um, the unanimous consensus of the bishops, the the uh, universal and ordinary magisterium was in support of the just the justice of, of the death penalty. Um, but, and he's, and he believes that Pope Francis completely changes that. And he justifies it on the basis that it was unanimous, but it wasn't unanimous as something to be held definitively. (laughs) It was just something that was held. It was just something that was assumed. Um, you know, never mind that the church is holding the Holy Spirit. Uh, well, there goes your charisma of safety. I mean, right. I mean, it, it's uh, the mind of Jesus Christ that Paul says belongs to us who are temples of the Holy Spirit. Uh, for all these centuries, we we understood the, the, the licity, well, the it, justice. It also of- runs up against Dona Veritatis, right? I mean, Dona Veritatis says pretty explicitly that even the prudential judgments of the Holy See um, cannot fall into error on a habitual basis. And if 1900 years isn't habitual, I don't know what is. <laughs> right? Like, uh, so. Well, I mean, even Pope Francis says we have to take responsibility for it. Basically, we need to repent. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, here's the thing. I don't even care all that much about the issue of the death penalty just by itself. I, right. I, you know, it, it's, I've never really cared all that much about it. I'd be fine with a move away from it on some level. Although I do think, sure. I do think with the high crime rate, it, it really does help with deterrence and, and everything. But, but the point is there are other ways that the Pope could have gone about voicing his opposition to the death penalty that would have been entirely harmonious with the past tradition. I mean, uh, even St. Augustine says that um, while the death penalty in itself can be considered just, it is super erogatorily more virtuous to opt for the merciful route. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's it's always better to be merciful than to be vindictive. Uh, mercy is preferable to uh, vengeance if, you know, all, all things being equal, obviously. Um, and so if, if the Pope just was, was trying to challenge us to try to aspire to the, 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 the heights of Christian perfection applied to the states, I'd have no problem with it. And that's kind of seems to me what Pope John Paul II was trying to do. Um uh, I know that he did kind of chip away a little bit at 
the prior justifications for the death penalty on like a philosophical or a theological basis, but but he still did say that it was in itself not unjust. Um, and so, but but he was nevertheless trying to move people away from that. You know, we we can rise above the strict administration of justice and then try to opt for uh, a a uh, a more merciful route. We can try to cultivate within ourselves a a uh, habitual preference towards mercy. You know, that would have been okay and that, that would have been very harmonious with what came before. At that point, then you could say, all right, maybe maybe the church before was, you know, speaking correctly about the moral and the natural law, but she wasn't challenging herself enough. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, this pope just doesn't have the, the lexicon, doesn't care all that much to uh, bring about that level of harmony. He, he's not like d doctrinal continuity is not one of his pastoral priorities and that's a hu that's a very big problem like that should be the pope's number one pastoral priority like that's his number one job is to safeguard the deposit of faith his number one job is not to help facilitate world peace I and mean, that that can be uh, ancillary but it's not the number one job it's not the number one it's not why we have a papacy and like the problem is when the Pope starts to contradict prior doctrinal propositions or uh, authoritative teachings, um, the faith that we're supposed to have, the assurance that we're supposed to have in the power of the papacy um, becomes, or at least it seems to become, a bit undermined. Like, why, like, what is the rational foundation for the trust that we have in the Holy Spirit's protection of the papacy? Well, it's it's the assurance that, that the Pope is going to... Uh, continuously from age to age safeguard the very same deposit of faith that's what really justifies the supreme authority that he has as as a man and as an office if he starts contradicting prior teachings well that gives the impression that he's relying on his own personal authority and then that amount of power for for one man if it's just on the basis of his own personality I mean, that would be despotic. I mean, that would be crazy. And, you know, I'm saying all this, I'm, I'm not saying that that is truly what the situation is. I mean, I'm a Catholic. I believe in all the divine promises that are given to the papacy. Of course I do. But I'm just speaking to the, the, the danger that comes with having a pope being this flippant or, or this, uh, this fast and loose with that obligation to uh, safeguard the deposit of faith in harmonious continuity. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very dangerous thing. We have to have the courage to be able to point it out when we see it, when we see it happening. Um, and I'll let you, if you have any thoughts about that, then, then I want to maybe shift gears a little bit and talk about the implications this has, because I think we've made our case very well. Um, but the implications that this has on uh, the our ecclesiology as Catholics vis-a-vis -vis the magisterium. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I agree with you that th th this could have been done in um, a very, very good... The, the call to eliminate and abolish the death penalty could have been done in ways harmonious with tradition. There's no doubt about it. And it would have been extremely easy to do. But... I don't think that Pope Francis um, believes that he's in continuity with the magisterial past on the matter. I think he knows that what he is proposing is a doctrinal, um, it's a, it's basically a, a backflip. And, and so uh, but he calls it overall 
a continuity and a development because the defense of the human person has always been the stronger horse. You see what I'm saying? So he, he, he thinks that what he's doing is actually the real sap of tradition. That's what he thinks he's doing. Um, and he's shaving off this other element. Deeper tradition, the esoteric yeah, it's tradition. A deeper <laughs> tradition that people were not aware of. Sadly, recourse to the death penalty was used in the past. Look, he laments it every time he thinks about it. So it's, it's obvious that he does not believe the death penalty was admissible even, even in former times. Um, so... Um, he just he knows that his project includes a backflip of a, a, a doctrinal reversal while at the same time wanting to um, uh, justify it on the basis of doctrinal continuity because human dignity had, has always been sacred in, in the uh, eyes of the church. Right. And so he's, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to, balance this out but he can't in the in the terms that you were supposed suggesting because his 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 uh, condemnation of the death penalty is equal with the condemnation of abortion and right. euthanasia and yeah. murder and that's not so, super irrigation that's obligation yeah. yeah so but yeah let's let's shift gears to well, I, I did want to say one thing that i found i was just thinking yeah. about it perhaps the only way that you could maybe accept what Pope Francis is saying on, on the death penalty would be if, if you added in a, uh, if, if you added in something that he himself would be completely repulsed by. And, 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 and it, you would have to like utilize the same reasoning that Thomas Pink does to talk about how Dignitatis humanae is harmonious with tradition, which I, I do accept his thesis there. It would have to be like the state has no authority to to issue the death penalty, um, but because God is the author of life, perhaps um, like the state only as an instrument of god's administration of justice and the only institution that could probably fulfill that would be the church hmm. like you yeah. see how that's the same the same kind of reasoning that thomas pink uses to justify like a confessional state even in light of dignity right. like, right. yes that, that's literally the only way where, where i could say oh, okay like because we don't have any confessional states anymore then no state has this authority of its own and so, like, recourse to the death penalty really is just on the same level as, like, self-defense and, and the doctrine of double effect, which would invalidate it as a morally acceptable. Uh, but, I, but yeah, I don't accept, I, I, I don't I don't accept that. I, I'm just saying that, like, that's, like, the only <laughs> line of reasoning that you could even conceive. But he himself would be repulsed right. by that because he talks about how horrible the concept of a holy war is. <laughs> so. Yeah. 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 Yeah, talk about a condemnation of the Crusades, not let alone the Inquisition. And that's why, you like, like all, all these people that like a lot of these Zoomers out there who are like making these based Pope Francis edits. Like, I'm sorry, like he that that's just it's it, it's just I know like they're trying to do it out of like zeal, out of love for the papacy, but at some point it just turns into like this other form of lying. Like, uh, do you know what I'm talking about, by the way? Yes. Oh, yeah. I do. I, I do. They, they don't, they, it's innocently done. You know, yeah. I, 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 um, I, I don't want to belabor naming names too much. No, no, I mean, a lot of these so. guys are my friends. I, I, I love them, but I, yeah. I'm just like trying to push back a little bit with, you know, gentleness, but, but firmness that I, I think the, all, all that does is it, is it makes us look like a bunch of like self-indulgent frauds. Like we're not. It, it, yeah. It's, it's like Christian gangsters. We're like thugs with, you know, our uh, apologetics. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it doesn't really accomplish anything and it's, it, and it's living a lie. Like it, it's trying to convince ourselves to make ourselves feel better about the state of the church when, when that doesn't that's that's a 
stumbling block for effective evangelization. I mean, people, you, you, we have to be on mission. I'm, I'm going to use like a really overused and cringe term that that like church that that diocese like to use. Like we have, we are missionary disciples. Like we have to be that. And in order to do that effectively, you have to remove unnecessary barriers for people coming into the church. And people aren't going to be attracted to the church if they're just coming across a bunch of people who are like not being honest with themselves about the state of the church and the state of the papacy. And it doesn't mean we have to turn into SSPXers. I'm, I'm certainly not. Um, and I'll, I'll still defend the Pope when I think it's appropriate. I mean, I, I still stand what I've stand by everything I said about fiducia supplicants, and people hate me for that, but that's fine. Um, but w I got to call a spade a spade when I actually see it. So this is like proof that like my defense of fiducia supplicants wasn't me coping because uh, because I, I, I never felt like the Pope teaching something in, in, in a magisterial document that's contrary to like definitive teaching. I never felt like that was a game over. Never yeah. felt that in the first place, and so like I only defended Fiducia Sublicans because I I didn't I genuinely didn't think there's just anything really doctrinally problematic about it, and and I s still hold my same view on that. But this it's just a direct contradiction, and so so let's talk about the Magisterium a little bit, because some people will say that okay, um, now what are are you saying that then the ineffectibility of the church is no longer a tenable doctrine? Are you saying that the Vatican I has to be revisited? Are, are, are you saying that um, Vatican II has to be revi revisited when it talks about religious submission of intellect and will, and, uh, and on what authority do you make that judgment? So um, I think you know where I stand on this question of uh, the charism of safety, but I do want to hear your take, and then I'll maybe give mine. I think we probably have the same take, though, at this point. Yeah, well, um, you know, there was a, there was a time where um, you know I had been in discussions with um, some other you know Catholic thinkers, and um, I was very much motivated in the direction of a protection of safety, um, a very strong protection of safety. There's some articles you can find on my blog, for for example, where I, I try to give a kick at defending that. Um, and, and so I, I think it's a lot of, you know, it's a, it, it's a, it's a noble task to try and make the papacy as clean, as helpful, as, um, you know, perfect as possible. I mean, who, who wants to have a, a, you know, a divinely instituted church government that can fail in, in ways that hurt us? Um, you know, nobody, nobody's looking for that. We all want this thing to be as perfect as possible. Um, but the question is, is it feasible to have it as perfect as we want it to be? And the answer is, is obviously no, we, we already know that because um, even, even uh, we admit that there are moral evils that can be done by our leaders and even scandalous things, you know, like when Peter stood in front, I'm sorry, when Paul would stood, uh, to the face of St. Peter. Um, so absolute perfection is just not, uh, you know, there's no angelic magisterium. It'd be nice to have that, you know, but that it's, would be. it's not what we have. <laughs> and uh, But when I used to be in discussions with these thinkers, Lofton was one of them, uh, I introduced this idea that, you know, well, if, we, if we're saying that the Pope can basically contradict Christian revelation, in his ordinary fallible magisterium one time, if we admit that it can happen one time, what would it look like if it happened like every Wednesday or <laughs> if every Pope going back to Clement after Peter were to be perpetual, uh, perpetual in their contradicting of the Christian gospel, divine revelation, the apostolic deposit, like they did it day in and day out, morning, morning, and then after lunch, they did it again, and then after dinner, they did it again, and then they did it every day, day in, day out for 2,000 years, right? 
Uh, but they never air, they never do it through the ex cathedra modality. So uh, Oh, I think we uh I think we lost him for a second. Let me just resend him the link. Sorry about that. That was getting pretty good. <laughs> I'm sure I'll come back in just a second. Sorry about this. But yeah, I mean, while we're waiting, I mean, I, I guess I'll just, uh, I'll look at the chat here. Uh, we did get a super chat from uh, Lucid Locomotive, and he says, can we receive communion if we think Francis is wrong on it being anti-dignity? I asked Jimmy Aiken, and he seems to say it's, it's okay if we have a good reason. Well, I mean, this gets into this question about the conditions under which it's it, under which it's acceptable to withhold assent from like a magisterial statement like if there are no legitimate reasons to withhold your assent then that would constitute a mortal sin to vile to to reject something that the pope has taught authoritatively like that would certainly be a grave sin and so you cannot present yourself to holy communion if you did that but and i guess i'll get into my theory about this about what it would mean from an ecclesiological point of view if the uh, Pope did contradict authoritative or, or let's just say definitive magisterial teaching. Well, I mean, I've done a whole video on this. You can go on my channel and check that out. But, but I think that, it, that, you know, what does magisterial mean? Like, what is the magisterium? Uh, magisterium means the teaching authority. So, a teaching is magisterial in the measure that it's authoritative. And a teaching is authoritative if it binds, right? And so if the definitive magisterium, the definitive organ of the magisterium is marked by an absolute assurance and it's an infallibility, well, then that's an absolute binding. That's a binding that cannot be unbound. And so if a pope were to attempt a teaching on the magisterial level that contradicted the definitive teaching of the church, well, then it simply would fail to exercise its magisterial status because it would already be overruled by authoritative teaching. And if it's already overruled by authoritative teaching, well, then a teaching that attempted to go against it could not be authoritative that would just be a contradiction in terms oh hello looks like he's uh no keep going i'm in the background keep going finish your point oh, oh okay yeah sorry uh, he i think he's on a different all right um yeah so so uh what i was saying is that th that would simply fail to constitute a true magisterial act I've likened it to the liturgy, right? If the Pope attempted to ad-lib a Eucharistic prayer, um, and let's say it was still valid, so he still said the words of consecration, but he attempted to ad-lib a Eucharistic prayer, but he hadn't actually formally changed the liturgy at this point, well, he would still be bound to the established liturgy at that point. And so his ad-libbing, so insofar as he ad-libbed the Eucharistic prayer, it would not and could not constitute a real liturgical act. It could not constitute a liturgical act because it's already overruled by liturgical discipline. Now, he has the authority to change it if he goes through the proper channels and overturns the prior discipline, but 
before he does that, the law binds. He's not just above the law by virtue of his own person. And so, so it would not constitute a liturgical act. Similarly, if he's already overruled by the definitive organ of the magisterium, if he attempted to teach at that level, at, 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 at an authoritative level, like at a merely authoritative level, then it would simply fail to meet the criteria for constituting a real magisterial act. And so at that point, it would be kicked down a level to private teaching, and all theologians agree that a pope can teach heresy at that level. So that's kind of sort of my way of getting around the issue, and I think it works. And some people say, well, that's an unfalsifiable hypothesis, but I mean, I don't think it is, because I, I also believe that if there's no prior magisterial teaching to sort of catch it, as it were, well, then I think the charism of safety would have to just fully kick in, and that we would be assured that, you know, if there's no prior teaching overruling what he's about to teach, that it wouldn't contradict the other rules of faith that we have. So, like, it wouldn't contradict the unanimous consent of the fathers, it wouldn't contradict scripture. Um, and this is just basically to say that the magisterium itself has to be able to exercise its mission. And, and, so, and so that's kind of where I'm coming from. Now, um, now I don't see, I think, it, I don't know if Eric is here. Did He's he not me? in the Jitsi right. meet. I tried joining again. Okay. Is it coming through now? Yeah, I mean, I I can hear you, but I just don't see you in the in the Jitsi meet. So I, I think you might be through Discord. Okay, so I hit the Jitsi link, and it brought me to another browser. It says join the meeting. Uh, can a uh, chat? Can you hear Eric? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, let, let's see what they say about that. Okay, but you can hear me, right? Yeah, I, I can hear you just fine. Testing, testing. Audience, can you hear me? So like, okay, they can hear you. So I guess you're just not appearing. Okay, so it looks like we're good. Okay, so you were saying something though before uh, yes. you left. You, you can sorry about that. Yeah, I appreciate your explanation for your view. Um, but what I was saying is that there were there were times in the past where I had you know thought about this whole issue of fallible versus infallible, and um, I sort of painted the picture of why it would be absurd if we can conceive of like every pope going back to clement just issuing out fallible decrees that contradict the faith like morning afternoon and evening of every day of their pontificate and let's just say they had that they were orthodox upon entry into their office right but then uh, you know subsequent to that they were always just spitting out heresies in their in their fallible magisterium for 2000 years that would be very discordant with god's plan with the papacy right and so the idea is well if that can't happen all these times and and catholicism still be true then why don't we just eliminate the possibility at all right and so you know there's this that there's that um there's that kind of leap to maximize because if you allow it once, then you could allow it all these other times. And, and so that, you know, sometimes you could, you could use this with like uh, even the moral, um, the capacity to commit moral evils by popes. 
you know, if a if a pope is a porn star, comes out as a porn star, and you know what what can be done, right? The, he there, there's no tribunal that could you know take him out of office. Um, you know, well, well, that would be extremely um, hurtful to the church. There's no doubt about it. Like if if like you had a slew of popes for several centuries that were all involved with you know pornography, the porn industry, uh, child trafficking, and, and like have, it was like, known. We had the pornocracy. We did. We did have that, but it was not as. Um, unashamedly public right. you know right. as as uh as what i'm speaking about so if you know we already believe that there's capacity to do evil but if 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 they were to go that far if god were to allow the papacy to be practically an instrument of world evil like that for century after century after century after century that just doesn't fit anymore and so it's impossible right and so some, what some people do is they look at that and they say, well, if it's impossible on that grand scale, then it's also impossible on the smallest scale, right? And so this is the kind of reasoning that plays into this whole issue of the infallible safety, where if you have one pope contradicting in his ordinary magisterium the um, the uh, dogmatic tradition, de fide, dogmatic teaching, divine revelation, however you want to call it, then that means that we could just have this left and right happening all the time, right? Well, that's not necessary. Just like just like our accepting the possibility of a pope coming out as, you know, a human trafficker one time, that does not mean that we are now open to every successor of Peter being a drug lord and a human trafficker you know that just doesn't fit with the design of god's providence and his control over history um so just because we accept that one particular evil can be done doesn't mean that our ecclesiology now has maximum capacity for a clear falsification so a contradiction in the pope's ordinary magisterium of the past dogmatic tradition or de fide teaching. That kind of thing is an evil, but just because we accept that that's possible doesn't mean that we've now opened the door to a Pandora's box where the papal seat can be basically like the chair of heresy for centuries or like a, a sea of pestilence, for example. Um, so that's number one. You know, and number two, um, the church already assumes that the the sheep of the church, and in this case, from Pope vis a vis the church would be all the bishops down to the laity. Um, the 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 church already assumes that we can have the intellectual ability to responsibly make a distinction between infallible exercise and fallible exercise and we know this from the profession of faith and the commentary on it in donum veritatis it all assumes that we have the ability to tell the difference between a pope's private opinion and when he makes an official judgment that's something that the church assumes that we have the capacity to do that right. well based upon that capacity we can know with certainty the content of a dogma to protect our souls when a pope in his ordinary magisterium contradicts the de fide dogmatic tradition. And we can have that assurance based upon the, the church's same assumption that we can distinguish between different grades of magisterial teaching. And so it's not, it doesn't lead to this Protestantization of the human person. That this is what I keep hearing from uh, some of the people that hold to this infallible safety theory is that if you don't hold to that, then basically you've Protestantized the whole. Right. Or, or the, the they Catholic. say something like only the Pope has the authority to interpret a magisterial document. 
It's like, <laughs> look, well, that, then we're at an infinite regress, aren't we? Like, yeah, I mean, and, it, it, uh, and... <laughs> look, I don't believe in the perspicuity of scripture, but I do believe in the perspicuity of magisterial documents. <laughs> they're they're interpretive, like that's their purpose. Yeah, and and so um, there are certain fundamental self evident truths that the church has vowed never to take away from us. Um, it, this is our this is our philosophy. You know, we a pope can't come out and say, "Hey, I am now teaching with my official fallible magisterium, commanding you that you cannot obey my command." That's a violation of the law of non-contradiction. It's a violation of other things. We wouldn't know how to obey that. Wait because a are you using your own reasoning? I heard modern Boethius on the timeline say that you should right you're using your own, own reasoning reasoning yeah well that's something that the church has vowed yeah. never to take away from us right. um and so i would just apply that um in its same species to um if a pope came out and just boldly contradicted you know in his in his in his magisterium his fallible ordinary magisterium if he comes out and contradicts what we have to give divine and Catholic ass assent to, um, then we do that to save our souls. There is no murder of souls there because we have the we have leverage to defend ourselves by our recognition and by the church's acceptance of our ability to recognize what a what the dogmatic in chief assent belongs. Do you see what I'm saying? So it doesn't result in the dangers that a lot of these infallible safety theorists hold because for them, they make it seem like if, if you hold to any other theory, then basically ev the whole floor beneath us uh, is removed. Yeah, and, and that's just, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's just not the implication. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that The church is going to have to develop just on this specific issue, you know, because I've heard some people in the chat say, well, can you point to any theologian that has articulated precisely your view? Um, well, no, not precisely my view, but we also have to concede the fact that um, that the crisis that we're in is sort of unprecedented. Well, there's, there's historical crisis. I mean, the 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 condemnation of Pope Honorius, for example. Yeah. Um, I've I've wanted to um, get some of these infallible safety theorists um, on my show to talk about <laughs> Pope Honorius and Pope Vigilius because. Um, you know, the the documents that are in that council that are still, they still exist in Latin and Greek in the Roman archives. Um, all of that there has, has everything you need to um, dispel the infallible safety theory. And uh, there's different kinds of infallible safety theory, right? Because I, I, I mean, I would, I would posit it. A certain infallible safety Me too. theory. I mean, my, my theory works on that, right? So it's it's like it's 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 a specific few that are out there right now that are gaining a lot of traction. But I haven't been able to get any of these guys to to really come into the to the box to talk about this, um, and I I just I just don't know why. You know, I I think that I've been very gentle. Um, I treat all of my guests like kings. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a conversation that needs to be had between two people who are well-educated on this matter. And I think it'd be very helpful, um, you know, going forward. So I, in short, I, I think that th this whole thing impacts our ecclesiology by simply opening our eyes to the fact that papal failures can arise to this level without collapsing the church. And, and yeah, yeah. Exactly, and and we can articulate a pathway 
that could help us deal with this issue ecclesiologically. Um, and I want to quote one pope who, in my view, did articulate a stance, at least implicitly, that I don't think can really be reconciled with the infallible safety crowd. And then people often, when I quote this, they miss the point. But I want to be very careful about it. I quoted it to you before. This is Pope John the Twenty Second, And I'm, I'm not going to point to the fact that he said something heretical about the beatific vision. Now, this is about that controversy, but this is a separate point. Um, but So this is in his retraction. And he says, quote, But if in any way other things may have been said, or said in another manner, by us, so he's talking about as the Pope, on this subject, we have said them in the disposition of the Catholic faith, and we affirm to have said them thus in discoursing and discussing, and we wish to have said them thus. Furthermore, if we, in what pertains to the Catholic faith, sacred scripture, or good morals, so I think those are criteria that would, if you went against those, would be pretty harmful, right? Um, right. Furthermore, if we, in what pertains to the Catholic faith, sacred scripture, or good morals, have said other things in preaching, discoursing, this is key, formulating a doctrine, teaching. So he's not just talking about his own private opinions, but he's actually talking about formulating a doctrine and, and, and teaching. Or in any other way, these, insofar as they are in conformity with the Catholic faith, the Church's way of thinking, sacred scripture, and good morals, we approve— other things, however, we wish to consider as though they were not said, and we do not in any way approve them, rather insofar as these might not have been accord in what we have mentioned, namely the Catholic faith, the Church's way of thinking, sacred scripture, or good morals, or any of these, we reject them, and likewise we submit to the judgment of the Church and to our successors all that we have said or written on these subjects, whatever and what in whatever place and in whatever situation we have or may have had up until now, unquote. So I think you can see that he is there conceding the hypothetical scenario of a pope teaching something authoritatively that goes against definitive doctrine. I mean, am I crazy? No, no, it's assumed. But um, I think what uh, someone might try to say is that that veers into private intention and not um, necessarily what's being asserted. You know, what's being asserted is like a hypothetical or something. And maybe in his mind, he thought it was a real possibility. But based upon the assertion itself, we could juggle between an impossible, possi it was like an impossible hypothetical versus his mind, which had a real possibility of that happening. Yeah. I don't know if you, you understand what I'm saying. I also see how that really squares, though, like because like the point that he's making in this retraction would be unintelligible if that hypothetical was considered just categorically impossible. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, Pope Agatho in his letter, yeah. it's 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 the, it's the same thing. It's uh, uh, it's the letter that everybody goes to to read two paragraphs from, <laughs> but they don't read the next paragraph after that one, where um, you know Agatho says, "Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe is me if I neglect to teach the truth." And um, and he goes on to give he cites the the Pauline anathema to those who come and preach another gospel and how his own head is underneath that dictum. Um, but see how what they do to get out of that is they'll say, yeah, but that's an impossible possibility. So um, he said all that. He wasted ink on a paragraph. Right. <laughs> but it's an impossible possibility. I think with John the 22nd, it's actually even less, I, I don't, it's less plausible to use that getaway because it's in the it's in the logic of what's being asserted. Exactly. Yeah, because well, he what he is, 
I mean, sure, we could say that he never, he may not have ever penned anything like in his teaching authority that that did that, but in formally issuing a judgment of rejecting like, potential teachings that 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 could fulfill that criteria, then that is conceding the po the possibility of that being realized, and that's in that's within his the judgment that he's making so yeah, the very patches, judgment is an error in his own statement you know? yeah yeah the very judgment would be unintelligible if we don't concede that possibility if at the very least we don't concede um the the theological conceivability of that ever happening empirically yeah it's 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 getting to that it's it's getting to that point where if you're trying to get around what you've just deduced um it's kind of like talking about the possibility of me surviving a, a one-hour swim in an Olympic pool with 10 hungry great white sharks. Yeah. You know, it's possible. We could sit here and talk about it, but we're going to look absurd, you know? And um, so I think the clarity is um, prevails against the skepticism. Absolutely. I just wanted to acknowledge one of the super chats from St. Peter is the rock said, very interested in this topic. Glad to listen and learn more. Well, thank you very much for the support. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Well, do you have anything else that you wanted to uh, say? I mean, I think, I think we, we've said a lot. Uh, I think we've really made our case pretty persuasively and convincingly. Um, is there anything else that, that, that uh, you wanted to, any, any other point that you wanted to make? Uh, no, you know, I think that um, if anybody has questions about this, of course, you know, they could send me uh, messages. But um, otherwise, um, if somebody knows of a uh, a Catholic who is willing to have a conversation about these things, um, I'm interested, you know, on my own show of uh, number, you know, number one, I, I, I love talking about the truth. I think it's edifying. Number two, I'd, I'd like to um, get my 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 own YouTube show uh, running on two feet sooner or later. Um, so I'm looking for people to, you know, create content with. So if those listening know, oh, I know somebody who's willing to talk about Honorius or Vigilius um, and this issue of the magisterial failures versus the infallible safety. Um, I'm game. I would love to talk to somebody who is on the opposite side of the spectrum or even close to me, but thinks that I'm wrong. Um, you know, I, I think that if I can't help them, then maybe they can help me. Um, and uh, I guess the only other thing I'd say is uh, my accessibility. Uh, you know, I have a Patreon, um, Classical Christian Thought. and um, you can find me on Facebook. I'm also on Twitter, uh, more now than ever before. <laughs> well, um, or they call it X. Uh, the, the site is better for it. So, well, <laughs> thank, thank yeah, you so, very much for this uh, conversation. I, I really appreciate it. We'll have to do this a lot more often. I, I, I would really love to do that. So, uh, th thank you so much. Yeah. No, thank you. I, I had a blast. Thank you. Uh, God bless you. God bless you too.